Hi y'all, I'll be doing a response to part of a video done by Ashley Mardell and a friend of hers named Riley. It's addressed to anti-feminists, hey anti-feminists, uh, of which I'm one, so I thought I would do my part to respond to a little bit of it. I'm going to pick up where she is uh, talking about there is a threshold uh, of what is permissible and impermissible to talk about from the perspective of uh, anti-feminists. So please take it away, uh, Ashley. It's almost like there's a threshold for them of social justice issues that are all right to discuss and support. There's general LGBT... I'm going to have to stop you right here. Um, it, 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 it may seem like it to you, but there isn't actually uh, a set of issues that it's okay to discuss. Uh, you can discuss anything that you should like to discuss. As you'll note later on, the people on my side of the argument tend to be pro-free speech. Talk about whatever you should like to talk about. That do it does not follow from that, that we are going to agree with everything you elect to discuss. I'm not saying you're not free to talk about these other issues. I'm saying that what you say is incorrect. Anyway, go on. He writes, sometimes binary trans identities like trans men and trans women, sometimes mental health advocacy, but anything above that threshold, like rape culture, trigger warnings, privilege, non-binary genders, Black Lives Matter, and definitely feminism are not okay in the slightest to these people. Now, every uh, they're perfectly fine to discuss, uh, but they're quite incorrect. Now, I notice, well, I'll, I'll just pick trigger warnings out of that litany of uh, issues that's above the threshold. Uh, one of the things about having a logical position is that it has to be internally consistent. And once you get into the game of, of um, sparing people's feelings or taking into account the feelings that people will have, the distress they might feel at hearing certain words, a certain sequence of words about a subject with which they're uncomfortable, there's really no stopping point. Now, I notice in your video you don't have a trigger warning for trigger warnings. There are people who... Uh, they feel some angst when people start talking about trigger warnings, and I notice that you discount these people's feelings by not giving them a warning that they are going to be exposed to that particular topic. In other words, the, uh, I, I hate to use the phrase virtue signaling, but it's a way of laying out one's moral bona fides that, look how com caring and compassionate I am, I take into account the feelings of others when I discuss subjects that I consider to be valid, that might be uh, distressing to these people, but the subjects I don't consider to be value, uh, um, to be valid, to be distressed about, I completely ignore. So, therefore, you don't warn people ahead of time that you're going to be discussing trigger warnings, or privilege, or feminism, or these other things, because you discount, quite properly, by the way, the uh, emotional angst or distress that an anti-feminist might experience at having uh, a video presented to them which will discuss these topics. I just take it when I just have an, in, uh, an internally consistent position by not warning you ahead of time that you'll be exposed to things you might find distressing because that's your problem to deal with, not mine. The individual in this community is slightly different. I want to acknowledge that before we continue. There will, of course, be exceptions to the things I'm about to say, and I don't want you to watch this video and then go on making sweeping generalizations, lumping people in this category and thinking everyone in it is one certain type of way that's not the case. That being said, largely the community that I'm talking about has strong associations with things like advocating for freedom of speech, atheism, championing logic and rationality, and if they have channels, most of the videos they make seem to be focused on ripping apart social justice advocates and their views. For the Once again, I'll concede it may seem like that is the case to you, but it does not follow that what seems to be true to you is, in fact, in reality, true. My channel, for example, uh, focuses on talking about nonsense that other people uh, put out there into the ether, of which feminism and social justice warriorhood is but a subset. So I occasionally discuss that uh, along with other things. And I'm really big into logic, being a logician myself. An actual one. I'll give this community a name. We'll call them anti-feminists. This is simply because while all their views differ slightly, a vast majority of them seem to have a major opposition to feminism. So anti-feminists it is. If I find a better name later, I'll refer to them differently. Now, the real problem I have with the anti-feminist community isn't their views. I mean, their views bum me out, but there will always be people whose views bum me out. That's inevitable. The thing I really dislike about anti-feminists on YouTube is how strongly they advocate for freedom of speech, yet seem determined on silencing anyone they... So, here is where the, the sausage of the argument gets made. No one is silencing you or anyone on your side. Silencing means to prohibit 
or pre preclude from speaking. No one is stopping you from uploading videos. No one is trying to make, make it the case that you're not allowed to say what it is that you think in public or in private or anything of the like. What you're doing is getting pushback to the propositions that you go into public and propose. Not all of which responses will be terribly polite, something to which you're not entitled. You're not entitled to be treated civilly when you're telling people things that are false. If you want to be treated civilly, you should make an effort to say things that are true. And in addition to saying things that are true, not abstaining from saying things that are also true, which should be said in conjunction with the aforementioned true thing, in order to have an accurate and honest, non-misleading series of propositions. This is a, a big trend among feminists. They'll say one or two things that are true, and then they will lie by omission. They will fail, they will refuse to propose the other part of the, the series of propositions that would be necessary in order for a person hearing this argument to draw a correct inference. A lie by omission is still a lie. I don't much enjoy being misled or having people attempt to mislead me. I consider that to be exceedingly rude, and it should therefore not be surprising that when people are treating me exceedingly rude, I'm not going out of my way to treat them overly cordially. Disagree with, and they go out of their way to do it. They actively search for social justice advocates and then make videos devoted. I don't know how other people run their channels, but I have tens of thousands of subscribers. You have about an order of magnitude more than I do. I would presume that your channel, that your reality on re YouTube, is not all that dissimilar from mine, namely in that the people who follow your channel occasionally recommend things to you, a subset of which you might elect to respond to. At least that's how it works here. I don't go out looking for people saying silly things. Uh, I have enough suggestions about that as it is. I don't need to go out to try to find these people. They have a way of making themselves known. Again, they go into public to propose a series of propositions and then complain when people in public notice that there's someone in public proposing propositions and then offer up uh, a rebuttal. If the rebuttal isn't tailored with all the right kind of perfect, delicate, feeling-protecting language that you seem to think you're entitled to expect. To ridiculing specific people. Yes. In my opinion, their critiques tend to be more condescending than constructive. When people are lying to me, I, <laughs> I do go out of my way to be somewhat condescending. themselves on it being a very logical, yes. rational oh my God. To <laughs> well, what do you That I do, and as I earlier mentioned, I'm actually a logician. Well, more particularly, I'm a mathematician. And if you know anything about logic, all mathematicians are logicians. Say to that then, do you think they are? Ergo, saying I'm a mathematician, a fortiori implies I'm a logician. Just to finish that out for you. As logical and rational as they claim to be? Absolutely. Before he answers, I will answer. I get this a lot from people who obviously don't know a great deal about logic. They think that what I'm saying is not logically valid because it doesn't seem like it should be true to them. These people are uneducated. People who are unlettered in a subject should not go around being surprised when people who are lettered in a subject know more about that subject than they know. And one thing about mathematics and logic and science more, more generally is that it is often counterintuitive. When people, in an ordinary sense, talk about that doesn't seem logical, that's not logical, or that's illogical, whether me, what they really should be saying is that just doesn't seem like it jives to me, that doesn't make sense to me. But if uh, the, the, the wonderful thing about logic is that you can actually sit someone down, start, for, start from some axioms, and then in a very rigorous way take them to a very precise, unambiguous conclusion which is either demonstrably true or demonstrably false. The, wonder, the beauty of mathematics and logic is that it allows you to come up with unambiguous answers. If an answer can be found, sometimes it's indeterminate, and well, you've done the best that you can do. Throw that over to science and let them do that little empirical thing for a while and see what they can come up with. Maybe they'll, have a, maybe they'll be able to make some, some headway there uh, for you. And then there's some back and forth on this, but putting that off to the side. The beauty of it is how little it cares about anyone's feelings or anyone's perspective or anyone's bias. It allows you to be objective. It allows you to be unambiguous, to make very precise claims, state very precise propositions that are unambiguously true or unambiguously false and demonstrably unambiguously true or demonstrably unambiguously false. 
one's feelings are completely irrelevant. Absolutely not. So. Oh, and the reason that we do this in mathematics and in logic is precisely because everyone does have a perspective. We are all uh, made, uh, well, you know, what is toleration? It's the appurtenance of humanity. We're all made of uh, weakness and folly. Let us reciprocally pardon one another uh, our folly. That is the first rule of nature. You know, that, that kind of thing. I'm paraphrasing Voltaire there. We all have the capacity within us to be an err. And the reason that science is so powerful and mathematics and logic are so powerful is that these are ways that we can get around our own errors, our own uh, shortcomings to be able to look at nature and appreciate it for what it really is, rather than what it seems like it is to uh, our unfiltered senses. That's the power of science, of actual science, not social so-called sciences. And that's the power of mathematics, and that's the power of logic. Their unreasonable uh, degree of being a, their unreasonable ability to actually tease out the details of the universe and to let us separate truth from falsity, fact from fiction, reality from imagination and our undisciplined emotions uh, can be separated out too. My problem with this is that a lot of times there are atheist channels, um, and I'm an atheist, and I don't want to like bring religion slash atheism into this, but it is largely like atheists who are like, I'm so logical, and I am perfect, and everything that I... I realize you're being slightly hyperbolic here, but there is no one walking around going, oh, everything I think is true, everything I say is perfectly correct, I am infallible, I'm incapable of err, I am actually Jesus Christ, really. That, you don't find any atheists walk around proposing that, uh, that set of propositions. It is objective, um, and that's obviously not true, but they try to pass themselves off that way. Like, their comments are always, this is illogical. Um, My comments aren't always that way, because sometimes people do actually say logical things, and incidentally, sometimes feminists do say true things. When a person uh, with whom I'm ideologically uh, in... in in a contest for seeking truth, to put it charitably, when that person says something true, I credit it. Why? Because it's true. And why is that? It's because of my biases. I am heavily biased in favor of true things and strongly biased against things that are either not true or have not yet been demonstrated to be true. We'll return to that a little bit later. You don't know what you're talking about and trying to discredit you and saying that they're... When it comes to talking about logic and rationality, you don't know what you're talking about. And your every pronouncement on the subject shows how unlettered in the subject of logic you actually are. Unlike you, I am educated in the subject. It is my bailiwick. When they don't recognize that every person has a bias, every person has a perspective, even I try to... Now here Ashley's going, yes, 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 you know, nodding along like a bobblehead doll. Yes, people do have biases. The fact that a person has a bias does not mean that the person is thereby incapable of thwarting that bias by uh, adhering to uh, rash very strict rationality, very strict, rigorous, brutal logic. I'm fully capable of doing that. And I'll, I'll tell you my secret. I'm indifferent about what the actual conclusions are. I'm, whatever they happen to be, I will believe them. I'm very easy to persuade. All it takes is evidence and an actual rational argument, an actual logically valid argument. Well, you can persuade me of anything with just those two things. The problem with feminism or this discussion about privilege or trigger warning, all those other things, is the absence of internal consistency, is sine qua non of a logical argument. It is not something that can be dispensed with. It is necessary, though not sufficient. I my own biases, my own perspectives, and my videos. Like, I know when I'm making an argument that this isn't the objective facts. It's an argument. This is one of my problems with feminists, or people on your side of the argument more generally, social justice warriors more generally, is that you know that what you're saying is not a fact. And nevertheless, you propose it as a fact. You go around presenting these arguments that you know are not factually correct, they're not objectively true, and yet you pretend that they are when you are proposing them. That is called being dishonest, and it really annoys me, and that is precisely why I am such an unrelenting dick to people on your side of the argument. If you want a civility from me, it's very easy. Make a sincere, genuine effort to be intellectually honest. 
which is an extremely low bar uh, to be met in a discussion, and yet it is one that feminists, social justice warriors more generally, run away from like creationists. They just run from that low bar. Oh my God, I can't clear it. It's just too much work. I can't jump over it. It's like, it's a toothpick high. What's your problem? Why are you body shaming me? That kind of thing. A very low bar, and yet it's one that you people on that side of the argument refuse <clears throat> to even try to meet. Um, so I and by the way, you are here supposing that the way that you go about arguing is in some sense reflective of how other people go about arguing. Now, I will fully grant there are other dishonest people out there who do argue the way that you argue. They know what they're saying is false, or at least they know that it isn't true, and they, uh, they or it hasn't shown to be true, and they parade it around as though it has, in fact, been demonstrated, or is, in fact, true, or that there is, in fact, some particular reason to suppose that it is true. One of the problems that plagues Western so uh, society is the absence of what's called the trivium. You're talking about rhetoric, the persuasion part of the argument. That's, uh, that's you know, tier three type um, learning right there. The, an intellectually honest person is going to take care that tier one and tier two are done well first, and then they get into tier three. This is the trivium. First, grammar, learning the nouns, the, the names of things, and their groupings, and verbs. And then you go to logic. This is the second tier. It's what's the relationship between these particular things in a group, and what's the relationship between this group and that group and the particular things in that group. And then you get to rhetoric, which is where you put it all together in an argument. Good rhetoric rests atop sound gra good grammar, a good knowledge of things, uh, a good way of being able to speak about particular things in the world or general things in the world, and rests atop logic, being able to correctly tease out the relationship between this category of things and the things within it, and that category of things and the things within it, which is to say between category A and category B, and within category A the things that make it up, and within category B the things that make that up. So the individual uh, subjects in the predicate, as well as the predicates to get, uh, in the relationships one to the other. You guys skip the grammar part, you skip the logic part, you go straight to the rhetoric part, straight to the rhetoric part, and it is exceedingly obvious to anyone who, anyone who has taken an introductory logic class. You rely upon e emotional exploitation at your every turn. Just recently, I was having a discussion with, an, with, with this, another, with a person who claims to be a mathematician, a professor of mathematics. Turns out she's not. She was an instructor, an adjunct instructor of, uh, of math at a junior college, but putting that off to the side, I realize that they're starting to call them professors more and more frequently these days, but whatever. Uh, we were having a, a discussion uh, on feminism, and uh, we, she said, you know, I want a logical argument, so I, we really start getting into the logic. And when she realized that she's been pushed up to a corner, and she has no out, what she says is, you need to learn some compassion. I'm like, that could well be true. I perhaps do need to learn some compassion. The funny thing about a logic argument is compassion has no place in it. Compassion is wholly irrelevant to logic. The moment someone mentions their feelings, they have forfeited any claim to be having a logical argument. They may be a persuasive argument. I'm sure there, there are uh, uh, very many ways that you can uh, put you know, feelings into an argument and have it still be a reasonable argument, not a, an emotionally exploitative argument. But it's not, it's not one about logic. It's one about other things. And so having, having realized that, uh, one, she was out of her league. Uh, she only has a master's in math, so what are you going to do? Uh, that, that, was her, that was the only thing she could fall back on was the fact that I wasn't, I wasn't being sufficiently compassionate in factoring her feelings into the discussion. Of course I wasn't. She came to me in the guise of wanting to have a dis discussion about logic a subject about which he was apparently uh, not interested in actually discussing. I think it's, it's misleading to say that this is everything exactly as it is, and I know that it is, without acknowledging your own perspective. Uh, that is not what a logical argument purports to be. It, it says, a, logical, a logically valid argument says, if you have true premises, you are guaranteed true conclusions. Then you, you turn, so validity is, is necessary, not sufficient. I work, on, I work on trying to make sure that I have logically valid arguments, though I don't generally state out all my premises because these aren't supposed to be lectures, they're supposed to be more conversive 
or as you kids say these days, so we can conversate. Anyway, uh, then you, you have to look at the soundness of the premises. And if the premises are sound, then the conclusion cannot be denied but on pain of irrationality. I do not say, and I've never met such a person who, who pretends that everything they say is objectively true, I make errors. I believe things that are false. But the distinction between you and me is that I make unambiguous claims, I don't equivocate, and I don't mislead people. So when I do make it, when I do inevitably err, someone will be able to unambiguously point out what my mistake is. And this is another thing that I do that is anathema to your side of the argument. I instantly accept the correction, and then I go forth and don't make that mistake again. That's a little something I call learning. A, a habitual uh, problem in, in, uh, in, the, so in, in the natural sciences, in mathematics and logic. We actually do this thing called creating knowledge, as opposed to feminist theory, gender studies theory, where you are really good at creating conjectures. I can conjecture all day long, with the best of them. The distinction is, is that mathematics and science are the way that we, we separate truth, you know, which conjectures actually bear themselves out in reality, whereas in the social sciences, you're all but helpless. Here, here's an interesting little tidbit about, uh, about the lay of the land in academia. You look at any standardized tests that you should like for entrance into graduate school, and there is one thing that is uh, exceedingly obvious to even the most trivial of intellects. Mathematicians and physicists dominate all of it. They are the apex of the academic world. Engineers come in third, usually. Uh, and the reason for this is that there is a different way of learning in mathematics and physics in particular, that uh, the, the natural sciences in general, but mathematics and, uh, and physics in particular, that is unknown in the social sciences. One of which is we get rid of stupid people on purpose. We don't validate ignorance. We shun ignorance. Uh, the, the way that we acquire future knowledge is by, by creating some knowledge and then dispensing with previous ignorance. So if you look at the way that uh, statistics is taught, uh, not in statistics uh, for statistics degrees, incidentally. St statisticians actually don't do well. Uh, they do about as well as education majors, which is to say not very well at all. Uh, they don't compete with mathematicians and physicists. But anyway, uh, when we're studying statistics, not as, as not to become statisticians, but in math, to become mathematicians or physicists, uh, versus how they do it in the social, so-called sciences, is that we have these things called weed-out courses, where we make them hard, though manageable, if a person really applies the effort, and they have some intellectual ability, uh, to weed out the people who either are too lazy or lack the mental firepower to be productive. Whereas in the social sciences, you want to care about people's feelings and show compassion and encourage them to do more than they can actually do. It's to help them make it through courses that they're not equipped to handle, whether that's because of native ability or previous failures in classes. Uh, one of the jokes in mathematics is people take calculus to fail algebra. The joke there is that people make like a, a high C or a low B or even a mid-range B in algebra, college algebra, and think, ah, oh, you know, I'm ready for calculus. And they get in the calculus and have their asses handed to them. It is not, it doesn't work that way. Calculus is meant to be hard. It is. It took thousands of years to figure this out. And you have to learn it in a very short period of time. And if you, and if you come out of a calculus class and you aren't just like all the time, you either have, uh, you either know the subject, in which case you're like auditing, you have to refresh your memory or something, you're a super genius, or you've not applied yourself. Typically, it's the latter. Very few super geniuses running around, not a lot of mathematicians actually sitting through calculus classes just because, though it does happen from time to time. But in the social sciences, you have the opposite view. Encourage people, help them along, give them lots of fluff homework and so they can you know, get their points and make it through and it shows itself in the work product that you get in these fields. That's why if you get a sociological study, a psychological study, anything from the social sciences, the safest course of action that you can do, generally, is whatever the conclusion of the so-called study is, believe it's complement and you will be right more often than not. Now, feminists uh, exploit the general ignorance of statistics. 
uh, in the general population and even um, among themselves. Uh, two major types. One's the people who know better and mislead others and the, the ones who are just, they don't know any better and they're helpless and they believe whatever they're told. Um, they, they rely upon people not knowing about the, Simpson, uh, the uh, Simpsons paradox. They rely upon people not knowing about p-hacking. They rely upon people not knowing about um, various other problems in statistics, which if you're not careful to pay attention to, will lead you to draw entirely erroneous conclusions. They demonstrate a complete uh, lack of knowledge in feminist scholarship, sociological scholarship, psychological scholarship. Uh, there are a reason that these people come in so far down the line when compared against uh, statisticians, engineers, I'm sorry, not statisticians, mathematicians, physicists, and engineers, and it is this. When a physicist gets it wrong, when an engineer gets it wrong, or when a mathematician proposes uh, a theorem that um, seems to be good but is actually crap and that's worked into science, and they get this wrong, people die. Bridges fall down. Planes don't fly anymore. That is the distinction. Where if you get it wrong in sociology, in psychology, or in any of these other fluff fields that pretend to be science, it doesn't really matter. No one dies. And so you can get along quite well, shining people on for years, producing absolutely nothing but conjecture, and being praised for being an actual academic when you are just a charlatan. And uh, they praise it there, anyway. Have you had any personal contact with the anti-social justice community? I have had people make response videos to mine with not the nicest language. This is, a, we'll talk about this problem of a, an absence of internal consistency, which, you know, logic, uh, here. He's talking, about, they're talking about getting responses from people like me, and this person doesn't want to uh, watch it because, you know, we say rude things. And then, because his watching our video would validate our position. If you had an internally consistent view of the world, you would have to thereby accept that my making a video about whatever it is that you've said validates what it is that you've said. But you are inherently overtly, nakedly, internally inconsistent. And yet you go around whining and complaining that people like me who actually understand logic, who are masters of logic, don't treat you with the respect that you foolishly believe you deserve. In them, um, that does send people to my videos, and that's kind of been my experience with them. It's just, I wake up in the morning and there's a hundred comments telling me to kill myself, and that's... Unless you are a very happy deleter of comments, I've checked there aren't a hundred such comments on any of your videos. That's really big. I'm sorry, I did a sample of your of your videos. <laughs> I didn't actually go through the mall and read all the comments, but I didn't find a hundred such comments in aggregate, let alone on any video. Extent of my experience with them. I try to avoid watching the response videos. Good for you. Um, <laughs> do you watch them? If, if they're I can't help it. If there's really? one about me. Really? I have not watched them. Oh, really? I have to. I know that there's a video oh just gosh. like hating me out there. I... Yeah? Yeah, maybe I'm giving them power. <laughs> yeah, I am. Yeah. Like, that's what I was worried about, is if I watch it, it's like, I'm giving them views. I'm sure. giving them watch time. I'm kind of validating that what they're doing is... is a, a then you should reciprocally accept that uh, they're making videos to you validates what it is that you say, but um, when a video is made in response to you, you run away from it. A thing that, like, people are going to watch. Um... But no, I feel the curiosity. Like, I do want to okay. know what's in it. But at the same time, I don't want to... I know it's just going to make me feel bad, and it's just going to frustrate me, and so I try not to. I think they have a very set values okay. that they adhere to very strongly and, like, identify with very strongly that, you know, there's no wage gap and trans people don't exist and stuff like that. Here, here's more of the, the disingenuousness that is the, uh, the staple of being a social justice warrior. No one denies that there exists, quote, the wage gap, end quote. Now, people do deny that there exists, with fuzzier quotes, the wage gap, which is to say that the shorthand that you feminist type people mean when you say the wage gap, which means the wage gap, which is caused exclusively by sexism, uh, that shorthand, people do respond to it by saying, no, that wage gap doesn't exist, which you then parlay into a pretense that they're claiming that there exists no difference in the aggregate amount earned by women versus the aggr aggregate amount earned by men. Well, actually, more particularly, you don't even care about the earnings, the, the salary, the payment that's taken home. You need to remember it's called a wage. It is a consequence of working, not just showing up and being like, hey, look at me. And men work more hours, they work harder jobs, they work more dangerous jobs, 
it should not be surprising that they get paid more. So to recap that particular point, no one is denying that men make more money than women make. What they do deny is that the disparity that they concede exists, that they accept exists, that they deny that it is caused exclusively, solely, or even largely, or even non-trivially, by sexism. A proposition which has zero support. There is no reason whatever to suppose that the aggregate take-home pay of women versus the aggregate take-home pay of men is caused by sexism. And one of the reasons for this is quite simple and it's quite logical. Uh, people are paid a wage and companies out there are in the business of making money. If they could shave 25% off of their largest expenditure, they would be fools not to do it because their competitors, if they did it, would be able to run them out of the business entirely. They'd be able to corner the market and yet they're not doing it. And the reason for this is that it's not sexism that drives it. It's the choices men and women make. Uh, for the for feminist type, social justice types, it works like this. If I'm a business, I'm in the interest of maximizing my profit. I really want to make money so that way I keep having my business. It doesn't go bankrupt. My competitors also want to make money. If they do something that cuts their largest expenditure by a quarter, and then I say, actually, no, I just really like having dick around so much, I'm, gonna, I'm going to go out of my way to incur a much larger cost per unit than I need to incur just to have some dick hanging around, they are going to outcompete me every day of the week and twice on Sundays. Labor costs are one of the most expensive things a company has. If it were really the case that they were paying women less than men out of sexism, then any company could immediately fire all their men, hire only women, pay them 75 cents on the dollar, and dominate the market. And yet, none of them do it. All right, uh, let's see if you have anything. There are nine seconds left. Let's see if you have anything interesting to say in the excerpts I have. That, and they want to defend those ideals, and they know that if they do it in this very inflammatory and aggressive way, that they will get views. And no, no, I'll get views regardless of my tone. I adopt the tone that I have because I hold you in such low regard because you're very contemptible people. You go out of your way to mislead people. You, you, make, you turn being ignorant into like a Zen-like mastery of the universe to which all should aspire. I find that contemptible. People who use only a, por a portion of their brain have already earned my contempt and I'm not going to be reserved in showing it to you. People watch me because I'm funny, one, and two, when it comes to it, I'm able to lay a logic bitch slap down on you people that you can't even see coming because you are so utterly incompetent. Have a great day.